I'm Patricia McDonald, Director of the Overch Museum of Art here at Wichita State. I had the wonderful opportunity a good number of years ago to commission Mel for an installation project, and I would tell you he is as generous a, a human being as he is inventive an artist. Conceptually rich and deep, he's ever imaginative, fearless, without a sense of limitations for what art should be, could be, with a keen social conscience, and concerned about how we live life on this still green earth. So just to encapsulize how we think about Mel and his stature and recognition, at any rate, and I'm going to do this part kind of briefly, he's had one-person exhibitions at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C. That's part of the Smithsonian, the Walker Art Center, the Manil Collection, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Mil Manil Collection that's in Houston. He had a retrospective that toured nationally. He's a recipient of most of the coveted artist grants in our country, including fellowships from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation. He's had two National Endowment for the Arts Award, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, Creative Capital, and that barely scrapes the surface. Um, this listing is representative, and I'm not going to even start on the list of honorary doctorates that he's received, visiting artist gigs that he's had at pre prestigious places, um, and actually the film he recently directed. He's sort of branching out um, there as well. It's a very tough job to describe the work that Mel Chin engages in, because his repertoire is ever expanding and, um, and malleable. Each project dictates its own needs, and Mel discovers ever new forms of expression and communication for each of the projects. Um, it's Mel's job this evening to recount what some of those projects um, have been, so I'm not going to um, get into that and recite. He, it's really up to him to recite a little bit more what he's done and why, so I'll sort of stop it there. But I, I will make the point, I know he's going to go on and on about this, because if you haven't learned this about artists, they get really lathered up and most excited about the projects they're working on presently. So I know we're going to hear about um, Operation Pay Dirt and Fundred. If you did not, as you came into this room, and for those of you in a little satellite room, um, if you did not look at the wall that's just outside 210, you need to as you're exiting. Uh, Mel is creating a project in the city of New Orleans to rid that uh, urban environment of lead contamination in the soil. And he needs, he needs all of us to get involved to help him make that happen. And that's the Fundred project, and I know he'll be uh, going on and on about that. Um, and yet I want to do a shout out to Carolyn Koppel, who's somewhere here in the audience. She is the Ulrich intern who really has been amazing with this project. Um, <laughs> Wichita is now part of it, um, and Mel's going to explain how, in a bit, he's going to be driving around the country to pick up um, all the, um, pick up the contributions to this project, and and Wichita is going to be a, a serious force in it with hundreds and thousands um, of um, dollar bills as contribution, and a lot of that happened because of the effort that uh, Carolyn put into it. So. Mel's art rewards looking. I remember years ago, um, he said to me that I, I am a visual artist and I care very much that there is eloquence in beauty. You, you do need to be grabbed by what you see. I would also tell you that Mel's art rewards thinking through looking. You think through it um, and with it, and I don't mean that that I don't mean by that that it's a cerebral art at all. Rather, that Mill's projects and art makings take on very compelling ideas um, and and real human concerns of our times. His deep regard for people and our planet shines through in most everything that he gets himself involved with, and. I see that viewers discover that passion by encountering and thinking about and becoming immersed in 
how Mel builds that into his art. So I was told to keep this introduction very short because I have a tendency to uh, praise and, and go on. So I will end with um, this short quote from the New York Times art critic Hall, Holland Cotter, who said this about Mel. Anyone looking for work that combi combines hard hitting content and formal beauty need search no further than Mel Chin. Fairly high praise. Help me to welcome Mel to Wichita and to the stage. I know why I'm here. Cause I'm caught in a trap. I can't get out. Because you know I love you too much, baby. Now why can't you see what you're doing to me when you don't hear what I say? Now we can go on together with suspicious minds. And how can we build our dreams with suspicious minds? <laughs> Thank you very much. Time flies like an arrow, uh, fruit flies like a banana, right? And time flies like an arrow. Thank you very much on that. So with that note, we should go to the White House. <laughs> this is the White House, and, um, and I was there in 1989. It was uh, the extravaganza that Nancy Reagan had established uh, for Christmas tree uh, bonanza. And I was there not to see them, Ron or Nancy, but to look at that column. Um, I had cleverly disguised a yardstick to resemble exactly a walking stick. And I stumbled onto the North Portico to take my measure. We were chased out by the Secret Service, but eventually I ran back to my parents' suburban garage in Houston, Texas. And all those Texan suburbans were saying, that damn chin boy's back. He's making a mess. <laughs> and they're building Chinese rocket boosters in the garage. <laughs> Eventually, the piece is completed, and this is what it looks like. Now, if we want to appreciate works purely on a formal basis, we could look at it all around, right? It's 3D, so we can look around. And it, at first glance, I, I myself would say it's probably related to the Greek ideas of perhaps the Herm, right? But if you want to go to another culture and look at it in a very different perspective and focus on one side of it, you would see Sheena a gig, and it would be and you could probably make the interpretation that this piece is a hermaphroditic ex uh, exposition of my sexuality or something else, and I need to get, go see somebody. Um, <laughs> but let's go back in time. Uh, 1967 is the launch of, uh, not this banana, uh, but of Andy Warhol's cover from the Velvet Underground. And then by 1968, is the consolidation of a single brand by United Fruit, Chiquita brand bananas. 1969 is the launching of Elvis Presley's Suspicious Minds, which I apologize if you're any Elvis Presley fans. I'm just, just trying to pull it together. <laughs> and the point about the, the, that is that Elvis is correct uh, in one way, that, but in another way, in the reverse. I think you have to build your dreams with a sus suspicious mind. And that's an integral to my process. So the, the column's actually, the piece is called The Extraction of Plenty from What Remains, 1823 Ongoing. And it's two full-scale White House replicated columns, right? Squeezing a cornucopia made out of mahogany, banana fiber, coffee, mud, and blood. And the, the, the piece is about Central America. And it is a critique. It is a critique that the signatures uh, on the tops of these columns are not real cracks. Those crenellations are actually the tops of US presidential signatures from James Monroe to Ronald Reagan at that time. And these are the signatures put in American foreign policy that have devastated the lives of people for a product like a banana 
for hundreds of years and continues somewhat to this day. But before I go into that, and it's sque well, they're squeezing this cornucopia made of products from that, and there's nothing more to give. So the piece itself is a commentary of our current political situation, continuing, by the way. But I want to talk about something else about it. To, uh, while I was making the columns in that garage, we were just using whatever we could as handmade. And at one point, it became so heavy that it fell and cracked and busted up. It was very, very clear in my mind. So I did a drawing. This is called biographic diptych. But the other side, collecting the blood, it was collected at an illegal slaughterhouse in the edges of Houston. They were killing goats. And I went in there ready to make my art, so invigorated and passionate to make a critique about something that I felt needed to be critiqued, our foreign policy. So I had all my art tools with me, and I was there to collect the blood. But as I was standing, when I went into the slaughterhouse, and I'm, not, I'm familiar with these situations, and it was, it was not the one that you would want to be in, because the person doing the slaughtering was actually torturing the animals, hacking at their throats. I was trapped in a room much smaller than this with them, standing and coagulating blood and a pile of viscera nearly as high as I was. And I had my cornucopia in there, and I was trying to scoop the blood and paint the piece and get out of there. But we made eye contact, and that moment he picked up a goat, ripped its throat, and threw it at me. It fell into the basket. I dodged, and it fell into the basket. And then he threw another one at me, and another one. And I started to grab the animals and spray their life over the piece until I was done. And when I was done, I exited with my so-called art. I was troubled, and I may remain troubled to this day because it taught me something. All my life, I thought I was something special in the way that I'm not special in terms of an artist, like I was an artist, that I was into a pacifism, into a lot of things. As an artist, I felt I was that way because the society had alienated me, and I was special because I had a special vision. But when we made eye, eye contact with the person doing this thing, and I realized how I acted, I became like him. And I realized that my whole world was just a delusion that being an artist is only one aspect, but being human is probably more. And being critical of myself was being more important. My delusion led me to believe I was separate from the cruelty of the world that is enacted every day, that I was special enough to be not part of that. Yet in the making of a work of art, I had to exercise it to the full extent. So it might taught me something that Sometimes, as it said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But often, we ourselves, not just the world around us, can remove the tools to examine that life. And sometimes the practice of art making and the practice of thinking is to reinvigorate that desire to be critical of oneself, not just the world around you. You know, um, I was invited to give my first lecture. I'm pretty comfortable now because I've been coming here bugging you for quite a while. And uh, my first lecture in New York City was uh, at the New School of Social Research. Now, y'all know what that school is? That's a school full of commies. <laughs> and, uh, and I was freaked out, you know. So I made this lecture act, and um, it's a, a book that I carved out and sharpened it and put my notes in it. And, I was freaked because it wasn't an art, I was an artist, but it was, a, it was a, a lecture that was requested by the School of Psychology and the School of Philosophy. And I was convinced that, of course, the School of Philosophy, of course, they would know that I didn't know what I was talking about. And, but the School of Psychology would uncover my deepest childhood trauma. <laughs> so I was paralyzed. So what I did is I made this ax. I made something. And I bought a six, I wrapped it up in newspaper and uh, bought a six-pack of Budweiser and went to the talk. <laughs> so there's a bunch of white guys smoking you know, pipes, and so I sat down and put it wrapped up, and I started pounding the beer, beers down. And I'm, I, though I drink, I am allergic to alcohol, and if any Asian brotherhood, sisterhood is here, we turn red, I get nauseous, and all these things, and get massive headaches, uh, which was proceeding after the dirt beer. Um, so the guy from psychology said, Mr. Chen, I think it's time to talk. 
And I said, oh. So I ripped off the paper, held the ax up, and said it. This is an ax. And he said, what the fuck are you going to do? <laughs> and I took that ax, and I slammed it into the blackboard where it exploded. The pages crushed, and my notes fell out. And I, my first note was, in Chinese philosophy, you became an ax. It was very successful because I was drunk. And, um, <laughs> and any time the guy wanted to talk about Plato's cave, I said, I don't feel like talking about no damn shadow. They said, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but the truth about it, it was successful because I was addressing everything that could be said in a single object. It is in Elaine Scarry's book that I may reference again, The Body in Pain, that she was the one who isolated out of Homer the arrow that strikes Achilles' heel is freighted with dark pain. It is an amazing construction, but it's a saying that an object carries something beyond what it is. And it has this kind of idea of poetry and ideas and even this notion behind it. And so the lecture acts was all I had to do. And so anyway, we'll continue. Um, so I look at, this is a, a piece, and, and sometimes works of art comes, come out of dreams, and this is a piece called The Bird is the Word. It is that bird, is the extinct species of the Carolina parakeet carved out of a single book, you know. And so sometimes we're making works that we don't always have a radical or political or formal explanation. They can come out of dreams, and they have all, all, everything said within them. And so I can make work out of dreams. And you can work, make work about people. This is Setting Sun Fan for Vincent Chin, who was murdered with a baseball bat. It's my blood on a silk fan that's unfolded. Sometimes it can collapse into a baseball bat and be unfolded again. He was killed in Detroit. He worked for the auto workers. Uh, he was an engineer, and auto workers killed him th thinking he was Japanese on the day of his uh, bachelor party. And in it, they ends up in Cincinnati, where the killers are acquitted. So never is there ever justice for maybe Vincent Chin. And so sometimes works can be about people. And they can be about the outrage and the injustice that occurs again all the time. And work can just be out from poetry. This is Rilke's razor. It's from uh, Rilke's poem, but he talks about beauty is only the first touch of terror that we can still bear. It is, sometimes it is about something that, um, it's also about Rilke and his, his um, poem standing in front of the archaic torso of Apollo, where he looks at all the broken fragments of this body and says, we must change our lives. And art can be about, this is a, a piece called Degrees of Paradise, and it's like 14 monitors suspended, and it's playing back multi-dimensional fractal imagery of clouds. In other words, either these are synthetic clouds when I was trying to discover a way of expressing what our atmospheric envelope was going through. And so you make an artwork that's not dedicated for my stuff, but dedicated to the scientists and the multidimensional fractals that were engineering something that had never been done before. I actually use the art to catalyze them to make a global model, which this is to celebrate. So sometimes art can serve those who are at the verge of becoming. And it's honorable to do so. I do re my research. This is my research. This is um, all the junk food spices that I could find. Um, and it's for a piece called Dispense and Distribute. Now, this is a funny story. Um, um, it was for a gallery in New York that wanted to do a flag show. By that time, I felt I was pretty smart and you're a conceptual artist. So I said, um, I don't know, that's, only been, that's a stupid idea, a flag show. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that at all. That's dumb. There's been like too many flag shows. Forget about it. That's how you are when you, become, you move to New York and you're involved with conceptual art. You think that way. <laughs> so, but then an idea came and you run to the gallery. I ran to the gallery and I said, you know, I love this concept for this show. And, uh, <laughs> And I love to put a piece in it. And the guy, the, the, music, the gallery director said, oh, well, you're too late. You're too late because there's the, the ads already printed up. And it had, all my friends were in the show. It was outrageous. And, but it had the last line said, among others. I thought that was super groovy. I said, that's me. I'm among others. In fact, no label, 
no signage. I'll bring it in, and I won't, I, don't, I, won't only, I won't even put it in your gallery. We'll put it in the hallway, and I'll plug it in. So we plugged in this vending machine, which are 30 American flags cut up into 30 pieces, cooked individually in junk food spices from ramen oriental to French onion to uh, uh, Mexican taco cheese to Swiss chocolate, and it was there, and you could buy each piece for a dollar. So it, the thing actually consumed itself away, so the piece was gone, and that was the end of the piece. Uh, but dispense and distribute was maybe making a uh, commentary. You know, we, we think of our world as being, uh, we talk about diversity and perversity, and we, we, we look at a world that we think that is so fragmented, we can never make this connection. And I think sometimes it's not fragmented. It's compartmentalized into sections. So sometimes, in truth, the only taste I can get from, about another culture may just be the non-nutritional aspect of a piece of a taco chip. So critically speaking, it is about uh, the way the world is fa fabricated. Now this piece is a mythic alchemic scientific investigation into the origins of alchemic processes from the Greek and the Chinese relationships. It is, uh, they have very cool names like, you know, the principle of polarity, the orbital rebus, and it's about the planet Mercury. It's tracked by the inner orbital space of Mercury around the sun, and the, the outer uh, parameters are described of Earth around the sun. But anyway, we're not going to talk about it because it'll take too long. Uh, and there's Jupiter circulation and self-sacrifice, blown glass, silk, wood. But let's talk about this piece. The last piece is called uh, uh, it's Pluto. It's about the helmet of invisibility, and, and it's about conception and, and perception. Um, and this piece is made out of, I made alchemic gold, which is the Illyrian helmet within, and the ceramic helmet that's surrounding it, and it's surrounding the coal that was used to make the alchemic gold. And it's all into one piece. And it's, it's based on Clyde Tomball's investigation of, of, in his Blink Comparator, where he looked at a million slides to finally see the movement of Pluto. I don't have that many slides, don't get worried. Hey, team in the other room, don't worry, not a million. So, but I, the, the piece took a year of research even before I began to make the piece. So um, it was full of ideas like this, and I had given some talks, but I never sp spoke about uh, this piece. And I heard a month or two later, it was at the Hirshhorn, that a museum guard was giving tours. And museum guards are supposed to say, don't touch, but this museum guard was taking people and talking about the pieces. So when he would come to this piece, he would say, now this is the headdress of an African king. <laughs> so when I heard about it, I called him. Because I, you, know, you pride yourself in your research. But I called him to say two things. One, thank you. Thank you for expressing yourself outside your station of being a guard. You went ahead and began to talk about something, and you used your imagination, and you did something that every artist should dream that they could make a piece that would compel another person in the audience to speak and to think. Thank you. It gives me meaning to be an artist because of that. Secondly, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because of my myopic concerns of Greek and Chinese, the great world cultures, I had ripped off the whole title was out of Africa. It is the operation of the sun to the cult of the hand that is alive in Africa to this day and its importation into places like Haiti and Brazil. The idea of metallurgy and the powerful idea of Akinga, the idea of the objects of strength that have the power to give life or to take it away. I say, I'm sorry that I ripped off possibly the greatest culture that could have contribution to this conversation. And I will never live it down for that. So sometimes you make a work and you're so focused, you escape the orbit of the worlds that are influencing you the most. 
This little piece is called The End of the World as We've Never Known It. And sometimes you're so busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted, all you got is a little paint. This is what you can do. But it is the world being burned alive by the MX trails, MX peacekeeper trails. And it's not a holy light. It is a nuclear light that is raining down upon the earth. Pop quiz. Who is Thomas of Coventry? That's Peeping Tom. Y'all know the story about Peeping Tom? Y'all know? Y'all know Peeping Tom? Uh, the Lady Coventry, was it, correct me, 1027? Art history? Uh, well, okay. Uh, Lady Coventry was in, it was in the serf period of England, and the, the, the taxation on the, on the poor were so, was so great, she asked her husband, Lord Coventry, to just give the people a break. It was just too difficult. The burden of grain, the burden of product to live within the fiefdom, right? And he, was, he spoke old English, so he said something like, you ride bare ass naked on a white horse at high noon, and, uh, and I'll bring that down. That's how, that's my interpretation of old English. <laughs> I was educated in Texas, and that's what they taught me. Uh, so she said, fine, I'll do it. So she did it. And the story is the people of Coventry were so moved by her bravery to go against her husband that they respected her and refused to look, except for Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom lifted the shade to look. And the story goes that he was struck blind. And this is a depiction of Tom's optical orgasm at that moment. <laughs> now, I show this piece because I love the story of her activism. It's a model that to go against all, or all or none, you just do it. She's a feminist, she did it. I love that, but I hate one aspect of the story, the morality. The fact that it taught people not to look because it is one of the portals of imagination that is key for the construction and the making of the world. I mentioned Elaine Scarry, and she wrote a book called The Body and Pain. And she talks about the unmaking of the world and the remaking of the world is defined by two concepts, pain and imagination. Pain in its final incarnation is war and torture. And it unmakes the world because it absolutely destroys the capacity for the formation of language. It eradicates it. And therefore, it will unmake your world. Inversely, on the inverse, imagination. If you close your eyes and just forgot about me, Something would come to your mind, no matter what it might be, but that what comes to your mind in language is called an object. And that object is essential for the construction of language. In her mind, it is a portal, or it is a path for the remaking of the world that is constantly being destroyed and remade every day. So in this, these two pieces are kind of point out to the way I think about things, too, that any access, any portal to the way of imagination is to be cherished and important to be protected and fought for. Oh, I'm sorry. This is... <laughs> it's my research. <laughs> no, this is Wheat Bran Everest. I, uh, I do research. In fact, I had this on the screen when my workers were coming in. That we, I have some assistants working and they said, well, I wish I could make art like that, just research all day, you know, lingerie. Um, but I had been researching for two months to find the correct brand and the correct uh, pattern. This is arabesque, right, by wheat out of France. And I, but at the same time, I was studying uh, ethnographic diagrams of tattoo of tribal women from Baghdad from the 1930s and 40s because I was looking for this concept of beauty. I said, where does it come from? Why is one construction this way and one's another, and what could I do? to reach this conclusion about the origins of beauty and how we understand and our engagement with the Middle East. So I was also studying spe uh, species of turtles. And this is a Rufratus, uh, uh, what is that, Rufratus euphraticus. And it is the Mesopotamian soft shell turtle, OK? So I was looking at that. That came from Peter Pritchard, uh, world global expert on turtles. So, I put them all together into a piece. And you know, sometimes you want to make a piece and you want to make it the most 
beautiful thing that you could ever make, and you unbox it, because I had to send it to people to help sew on and do the lace and embroidery. I unpacked it, and I had assembled one part. You have all these different hands, and you crack it open, and you say, this is the most strangest ass thing I've ever made. I don't know what this is. <laughs> but, you know, and, but it was ready to wear. It was ready to wear, and, um, and it's still strange. But sometimes, maybe that's what it's about. It's about the strangest of the world, and maybe the strangest that I, as an artist, would be even thinking about beauty. That what kind of beauty is there to discuss when this species, that some people think are homely, and some people they conceive as homely, is being eradicated by an ongoing war in Iraq. That as a, as a species that has been around since the Cretaceous, that has been here for 70 million years, and within a period of 10 years, could be wiped out from the planet of the Earth. So you think about what is beautiful, then maybe it's not about that. So the questions an artwork can also begin to create the conditions of a question. And that's what I feel. And we have an excellent quote from Mr. Rumsfeld. Forget him, right? <laughs> OK. All right. Man and the turtle very much alike. Neither makes any progress without sticking his neck out. Right on. Get out. OK. Uh, <laughs> This is a painting. This is a painting uh, and a frame, but most important, the frame that was made. And this is about Leopold II, uh, who's from Africa in the turn of the century. He celebrated, Leopold II is celebrated for the origins of the modern human rights movement because he ended the slave trade in the Congo. He stopped the Arab slave trade in the Congo. But he appropriated the entire area of the Congo for his own territory. And it is probably the, the place of the first genocide of the modern era, where they can only estimate 10 to 20 million Africans perished under his rule. It made Belgium wealthy, and we traded with them like everybody else. And to this day, it's probably not understood the impact he had. And this, this concept, why well, I research this stuff, because it makes me so angry when I hear what's happening in Africa is due to simply something tribal. I think there are relationships that have deep, powerful impacts for many, many generations. So, um, so the piece is a frame, but it's not quite a frame. The mouth of the, is the, is of the hippo is incorporated. The African rubber tree plant instead of the acanthus leaf is used. Um, the, the handle of a whip that was used, made of hippo hide, is, is used. And instead of the egg and dart, it's diamond and dart. Because it's talking about all the products that were being shipped out of Africa during the time of Leopold II. And then the whole painting is covered with a bed of nails being driven in. 700 pounds of nails are driven through. And the shape of the old rotted wood is the arc of the Congo River. And it's leaned across on the painting. And what it's saying here, none of the nails ever touch. Never know the because. The, the idea of these fetish objects they call it here, the, these, these uh, Nakonde figurines in Africa, when they drive the nails, they're driven to not be this voodoo thing. It was there to seal a deal between your neighbor, to bring peace, to bring an idea of, of respect to your neighbor. And here I'm saying no matter how many nails were driven, they could not stop the modern era and the rush of colonialism. Okay, pop quiz number two. I'm strapped on your block with my Glock, ready to let loose at any imitator that I spot. <laughs> Who did that? Who did that? Whose words are that? <laughs> Good try. That was not Snoop Dogg, but Malik. You know, Malik. Malik did that in the first album, Doggy Style. Um, so. Uh, it's a Glock 9 millimeter handgun that's been totally cored out, right? And what's replacing it is a saline bag, a, a, a 100 FM radio transmitter, oxycodone hydrochloride for pain, ACE bandage, 2 inch ACE bandage, auto injector epinephrine for blood pressure uh, dropping, and a 14 gauge angiocatheter for pneumothoraxic shock. It's a complete gunshot trauma kit trapped within the gun itself. The more you de deconstruct the gun, the
the more you get at what may save your life from a gunshot wound. And the point of this is the gun is such a powerful, iconic force, it's hard to kind of revamp it. So instead, I chose not to revamp it at all, but to lock within it the capacities of its discovery, of its use, this other use. And in Homiso 9, what we're talking about is sometimes the transformations when you're working in society, you have to be covert. You have to keep it hush-hush on the QT to make it effective. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Because your peers are so strong, whether you're in art or politics, that they can make you go with their flow. And it's okay. It's not judging them. But you to be comfortable within your social station. And if you want to radicalize and get out of that, it's very difficult. So that's sometimes it's about that. Okay, let's look at some work. How are we doing? How, everybody okay? I'm talking so much. You all right? Keep going. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Miss Patricia. Um, this is artwork I did not do. This is a, uh, a mosquito brooch with yellow fever on it. This is, uh, so sometimes you can be artsy craftsy. Sometimes you can be disgruntled. This is a U.S. mailbag with an AK-47 clip on the bottom. <laughs> Magazine, get it? And sometimes you can be like David Hockney. This is the place where Rodney King was beaten. And sometimes you can be like an advertising agency, death and destruction, and be like absolute uh, vodka ad. And sometimes you put it all on Melrose Place secretly. <laughs> and so you have to be sneaky and covert. For two years, we inserted these props that were made by what we call the Gala Committee. This is a group project. And we inserted these works. Not, and we never tried to advertise it. Uh, it was a secret covert product project to insert on the medium that says that no matter how, it tells you, you know, I watch it. I know no matter how much Diet Pepsi I drink, I will never even begin to approximate even fat Brittany. It will not work because, but it talks about your inadequacy of your look, of your mind, whatever. But it's to sell product. It's a whole experience of television to this day. And for many years, there's a critique of this. But instead, our jo jo job was to come in and insert within it and be friends, to be collaborators. You want to watch a little Melrose Place? Got some phenomenal pieces. Yeah. Fireflies. Looks like a bunch of dots to me. More like firefight. And that's racers. Explosions. It's a bombing of Baghdad. What do you think it means? Mm. I think it's about a man's journey through war, uh, memory. And I think it's about killing what that does to a person. And it makes its mark deep, you know, inside. So anyway, what is this now about? Do you represent all these artists? Well, actually, I represent the entire museum. But yes, that includes each exhibit. You know, I wanted to major in art, ah. but it wasn't practical. So I majored in business and minored in art. I went through this bohemian stage where I considered forgetting about money and I just wanted to travel and paint. That was my dream. What changed? Poverty sucks. Right on. <laughs> I tell you, as much as I love art, I am much more of a music guy. Well, why didn't you do it? Got by me, I guess. Our dreams don't go anywhere. We just forget about it. Amanda, excuse me, but the publisher from Art Form is here to see you. Okay, I'll, I'll be right back. Great. Would you choose art or art form? Uh, uh, art, love or art form? I say stick with love. I would I, recommend. I really should get over No, wait, don't. Yeah. Stick with the guy. No, wait, I'm, Amanda, don't. We've lost her, the world of art form. We had an auction uh, to sell all the work that we put on Melrose Place, and we sold it at Sotheby's, and we gave away all the work to women's charities um, in Los Angeles and Georgia. We were the gala committee. And Gala stood for Georgia and Los Angeles. I was at the University of Georgia in Georgia, ironically enough, and, um, and at CalArts as a scholar in residence. But the project itself was, is, is about collaboration. 
because we're not just subverting Melrose Place, we're working with the writers and producers of Melrose Place to do something that had never been done before. It's a blueprint to say what commercial television could not say through the props and the ideas that we're inserting within. So we knew that the, the, the experiment was of art as a virus going into a prime time situation was not to undermine it, but to set another level of possibilities. Because now that it's been um, gone, it's gone away, it will come back as a rerun, perhaps, to the United States, like many viruses do. But it's syndicated in like 60 countries all over the, country, uh, all over the world. And this is the power of a medium that I felt at that time, as a theoretician, but more than that, as someone engaged to actually do something to insert and go into. And I am, I'm, I'm really, that sequence that you saw was one of many scenes, but it was totally removed by the editors. It was the executive editor that went to Aaron Spelling, the, the chief producer of the, of the program, and it was put back in in its entirety. And that was the commitment from the people we were working on with on the set. So we're talking about sometimes making art is not about being so super cool and so subversive and all that. It's about being, again, looking for what can be said. Uh, my whole, this idea of collaboration um, starts with probably, I was a potter too. I did pottery. And uh, the dude that threw the banana, right on. Um, he's a potter. He's a oh, cycle ceramicist, crackpot. And, um, and the reason I bring this up, because my whole idea of, uh, of group activity and working in collaboratively was learned with women, mostly women it was at that time in the 70s in the pot shop where we learned to work together to turn up the kilns, to mix the clay, haul the stuff. And I learned another kind of engagement that was not about me, but about materials and the truth of production and comradeship. And that is a lesson that informs a lot of the ideas of collective activity that I, that I do now. That it's OK, it's cool. It's not just always about you. That it's about other things that are important for the rest of your life. Uh, collaboration also created the Nomad Confederacy that luckily I had uh, Patricia allow me to do in a mapping show. Uh, I was interested in maps that occur not so much and on paper, but maps that occur within a child's mind as they play a video game. So Nomad is a video game that I remapped the entire uh, Middle East from Turkey to the edges of Kazakhstan based on antique tribal rugs and worked with these brilliant uh, video uh, designers to create these rooms that you could drive into. There was never any killing. It's more about memorization of pattern and time. And, and what I was addressing is a culture that is being eradicated by conditions of war and nationalism. At, meanwhile, while a culture of video gaming had almost reached at that time its billion dollar status per year. So you have one thriving and one dying. So Nomad, again, I thank Patricia for allowing me to engage in this. And this is just a demo of how it would look as you drive through it. So we can continue. Okay. I think it's time, um, let me see, a trailer. I'll take a break, a trailer, a film. I went to Santiago, per my instructions. I went to America, to New York.
So a new project uh, just completed. It was scripted maybe in 2002, but it took to 2007 to finally produce the entire film. It's only 24 minutes long. I only showed a trailer. I will leave a copy in the hands of Patricia for those that may want to see it another time. All right? Right on. So that's available for you. Um, but just to break it down for you, it is a project about decentering. I knew it in 2002. As I walked to the ruins with friends, some who were deeply traumatized by 9-11, and I saw the photos of, of loved ones mapped on the streets, I could not get to ground zero. I was turned away by my own feelings that I said, oh my goodness, now hope will have to be eradicated somewhere else in the world. Because I knew from that effect that we would take that incident, that horrific horrific kind of tragic situation and turn it around and make it a tool of war. And it has been done. At that time, I was very conscious of another 9-11, because I know my American history, that a 9-11 in 1973, it was Nixon and Kissinger that orchestrated the CIA operations that launched the attack in Santiago, Chile, that killed the president of that country and eventually 3,000 people were murdered in the stadium, almost the same number that died in the towers close by the presidential palace. And then, but as a Chilean, Chilean who saw this film pointed out, you woke up to one of the most horrific things anyone could experience in New York, but you know, it was sort of over. We woke up and it lasted 17 years, how long your government supported Pinochet, the dictator of Chile. So you, the film is, not, is only a love story to set things in motion for, I think, I think you should be critical, I think you should have opinions, but I only say to myself, without the information, if I'm ignorant of the realities that surround my world, how can I make an informed decision? And that's why I make art sometimes to get there. Katrina, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about this. I was there uh, shortly after the storm, uh, well, months afterwards, but it still, it was so heavy duty uh, that I was traumatized. I was traumatized because priding myself in the capacity to think on my feet and come up with things, I was confronted with a situation that I had no response for. It was too, it was immeasurable. The magnitude of the tragedy was so great that it's not just the physical, it was the emotional and the sociological devastation was so great that I felt I had no power or capacity or creativity to add. And I left. I left, but I kept coming back. Um, I used to say that this was a project, was covert for two years now, but you know, if I told you about this project back then, I had to kill myself uh, because I swore to secrecy this thing. Luckily, I didn't say a word, um, but we know about it. There was a storm over New Orleans very well. We know about it, and how many people, probably many people here probably helped people from New Orleans. But I looked at, I finally found out about a disaster that was there before the disaster. It is this map, this map of New Orleans, and this map details something that's critical. 400 parts per million is the level of lead that the EPA sets as a threshold so a child should not touch that bare soil, like a playground soil. It should never be above 400 parts per million. There are 86,000 properties in New Orleans above uh, 400 parts per million. There are properties that I've been on at least 3,000 parts per million in the soil. And these are just numbers, and we can keep measuring and keep measuring and understanding how New Orleans was the most lead polluted city next to Cleveland in the United States and it was that way before the storm. It was there that way as it is now. And we could start thinking about that way. We can look at the, it's the murder capital of America. And we can look at a lot of facts of its educational deficits. But one thing I found out when I was there, that this map indicates that 30% of the inner city childhood population of New Orleans are blood poisoned before the storm ever got there. And some of those results of crime about educational deficits are related to lead. 
it is probably the most studied and understood situation uh, as far as medical uh, realities are concerned. So what I'm really talking about is something in the blood. It's in the blood. And it's, it's within children. Uh, and we have to, uh, it became my means when I first understood this, I understood it as something that I had to tackle. These are like conceptual notes, but essentially it's the idea of rebuilding from below the ground up, and this idea of the magnitude of the tragedy deserves something of equal magnitude to respond. And that's, um, and when I first heard about the blood poisoning of the kids, I said, okay, let's work towards a solution. And the scientists at the time, and I was talking to Dr. Howard Milkey, who'd studied the soils and uh, toxicology for like 20 something years, said it'd take about $300 million. Uh, that's how much it would cost. I immediately said to him on September 29th, 2006, I cannot raise that much money, but we can make that much money. And this is the beginning of this $100 bill project, see? Because there is value in that. So this is a nice um, idea of, I'm sorry, this is PowerPoint and you have to endure all these fancy things. Um, so it's an operation pay dirt. And there is a covert. There was a covert and clean side uh, to it. Now it's out in the open. It's called Fundred, right? And then there's a difficult and dirty aspect of really transforming the soils and doing the job. So this is one part. Fundred on the clean shovel is the making of the art, the making of the voices that we, could, we can bring in to deliver the solution. And there's also a pragmatic aspect of the science and the program in order to execute the coverage and the transformation of 86,000 properties. You have all this, and hey man, is Wichita there? Well, it will be. Okay. And you have children engaged with this process all over the country, right? And you all know the Fundra.site, uh, Fundra.org site. If you don't know it, check it out. It's kind of wonky. We're trying to redesign it, but it's done by this, you know, it's done by me probably. Uh, <laughs> But you can download the template, you can get the template, and it's real simple. And you could use it from, as a historical, scientific, or art experiment, and you can work with your children or, any, or yourself. Uh, it's, the age limit is 125 years old, if you're that old. I only say it as a limit because you, you don't want to take advantage of someone's too old to make a decision if they want to donate the bill or not. And you can get a variety. You're able to draw. There you can do animals, you know. And I love, like, the logo, uh, instead of, in God we trust, this young uh, woman wrote, ooh la la. I like that, too. I'd take that. <laughs> um, and you could have, uh, you know, underdog will survive and people, so you could have faces, places, people, whatever you want to do. It's an operation where it's a simple drawing of currency that is creative currency that has tremendous value as far as we're concerned. And this bill is very important to me because it's one of the bills I've got from a child who was stranded somewhere in Tennessee. I never met her, I don't know who she is, but it's a map of New Orleans, or, or the state of Louisiana, and forgotten. And her home was last, her last home was the Superdome. And it's a black sun, and the slogan there is not ooh la la, or in God we trust, it is the simple word, help. So we have a pickup plan. We have the pickup plan, and we have the tools to do this. We have an armored car that runs in straight vegetable oil. It will stop at school cafeterias and refill with its uh, used cooking oil. Its payload will be 7,000 pounds of drawings. That's at one gram a piece. I only estimate it actually 6,608 pounds is what we estimate uh, 3 million drawings will be. We will collect all of it every drawing, and we will take it to the steps of D.C., to Obama-rama and Mr. Joe Biden, and we will ask, we'll ask for the even exchange. We'll ask for the even exchange to support a method of, of science and uh, an organization to transform all those properties, okay? So that's what it is. That's what it is. And the process we use is called TLC. You, you know, the lead is the nasty, nasty. The lead is treated with a compound that changes it. It's called appetite 2. And it changes the lead that can get into the blood, into the bone, into the brain. And that's the most damage because it removes the plasticity of the brain is the lead. We have to get it so it's non-bioavailable. -bio 
there will be a chemical sexual bond that is unbreakable. And this bond is called pyromorphite, and that pyromorphite cannot be digested by the animal, human, or pet, or anything that ingests it. It will pass through. We have to get it there. And then we will cover it with some of the cleanest soil in the United States that washes down at 300 million tons a minute in the Mississippi River. So the key to this thing is New Orleans itself. We want to envision, I want you to envision that New Orleans will be the rescue city. It will no longer be the pariah city that needs help and the most dangerous city. It will be the city that has transformed its entire ecology and it could be there to have the methodologies and the materials of the soil and the science to save Detroit, to save Philadelphia, to save Cleveland and all these places. And that's what we're talking about, and Baltimore. So update, there is a safe house. This safe house was constructed. I actually worked on it. I always put this slide in because people say, you don't do a damn thing. But uh, <laughs> so I did work on it and it is operational. And we, had a, we cracked the safe door open and people filed in. And we had a meeting where we announced the reality that New Orleans is lead poison. Sitting to my left was Dr. Ha uh, Kevin Stevens. And he's the, the, the head of the health department of the city of New Orleans, Dr. Howard Milkey. Mary Rubin, my uh, national coordinator. Howard Milkey is a toxicologist who isolated the problem in the soil. Dr. Andrew Hunt is a geochemist working on the protocol and uh, Kristen Lamarck is the New Orleans Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. We all sat there, we were locked in the vault till they came in and people came in at our national press conference. And on the walls were hundreds. It was not full then, now it's full. We have now 6,000 hundreds on the wall in New Orleans. And Uma, Uma Thurman came in and did one. She's real tall, so I said, you get in that stool and put it up there, Uma. And uh, go girl. It was not a kill bill, it was a make a bill kind of routine. So she is down with that. Uh, so, and we have operatives. We had our first operative meeting way back when in New York City. They are carefully blotted out so we don't know who they are at the time. Now they can be revealed. Our armored car did come to New Orleans and we had more operatives then. But now it is cool because it is exposed. And we are asking that uh, Amy, who's been working with us here in Wichita, Amy, you stand up a second because she's been helping out. And, and, and Carolyn, who mentioned, we need help. We need interns or whatever to help out because we would love to match the promise of Arkansas that wants to deliver 500,000 bills. We can do it. It's not, yes, we can. Yes, we must do this because we will deliver the message. And I want to tell you, I have prepared the Kansas, we have digressed because of today, I, I, I swear by this, because of March, today's the 5th? Okay, I rerouted the pickup route. We are coming to Wichita. We will come with the armored car. So that's the story. I mean, I think that, but I thank you for your patience and everything. I'm so happy to be here in Wichita and thank you for your generosity very much.